Hello, welcome. Um, well, probably most of you know that this is a, a conference chat a lecture organized by organized by the EMED and our MA in communication of conflicts, peace, and social movement. And so we are grateful to the EMED to be to be partners in this adventure. And we are grateful to you for coming. We have invited for this today, um, Carol Malouf. Maybe you have search in the web about her. Well, I, 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 I guess not much. But I'll just give you a few words. Yeah. She, she's from Lebanon, she's from Beirut. She's been working as a journalist for several years. She's still a journalist, okay. but she's also a political communication consultant, and she's an activist. These are three dimensions, at least three dimensions. But she's going to become a mother in two weeks. Yeah, two. It's the most important thing, actually. But <laughs> we're not going to talk about this at the moment. Yeah. It's not planned. <laughs> um, three dimensions that we don't get together uh, very often. And these three dimensions, uh, but mostly activists and journalists for us, uh, uh, in our concern, are the most interesting one, dealing with refugees, immigrants, and the war. The war in Syria, mostly, but also somehow in Lebanon, too, because it, it's the area that is at war. Yes. She did, before she was pregnant, <laughs> she did things like traveling with a family from family of ref, war refugees from, from Turkey to Germany uh, with a boat that was, uh, that was empty of oil, of petrol, 200 meters before they reached the Greek coast. So she, as many, could have died. She was arrested in Macedonia for eight hours, and she has suffered that trip with all those who were fleeing the war, but also with others who were not fleeing the war, but took the same trip. She probably will speak about this, uh, this experience of life. Um, you can, if you search on the web, you'll see her speaking about all these events uh, on English TVs or ABC Australia, but also in the French 24 hours, but in English, doesn't mean he speaks on, she speaks only English, she speaks French too. But I haven't seen any video with you speaking French. Not for broadcast. Uh, <laughs> just in the family. Yeah, uh, just yeah, right. um, and she also, apart from working uh, on TV, she is, has been writing for the Daily Telegraph and for a newspaper, a Lebanon newspaper, mm -hmm. that, because I will not pronounce it correctly, I know that the translation means the Republic. Al oh, Jumhuriya, that's correct. Which is the most important newspaper. One of the good ones. She did very risky things. She, she published an interview with two members of uh, Hezbollah that forced her to be out of the country for six months. So she's got to take care. So we invite her to speak as freely as she can and whatever she likes about these three subjects. And if she wants to speak about anything else, go ahead. Okay. Here we are. Thank so you. please, go ahead. Thank you. Malou, thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I'd like to thank Elisabetta from uh, IEMED, and uh, I hope I can pronounce this correctly in Catalan. It's Javi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Professor Giro here, thank you very much for having me, and thank you all for, uh, for coming. Um, I, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm currently uh, 33 weeks pregnant, as you can see, so I look slightly different <laughs> in the pictures that we will discuss uh, shortly. Uh, allow me to tell you a little bit about myself. I've uh, designed this presentation to make it uh, personal, where I can share my experience with you and, uh, and I can also answer some of your questions. I know there's a lot of information and misinformation on uh, social media. 
and I will try to make it as uh, practical and less theoretical as possible so we can, you know, all uh, share our common experiences. I was born in Lebanon and I am a child of conflict. I uh, remember growing up in Beirut in shelters where we used to gather around uh, the radio and I remember the radio back then was uh, battery operated because we didn't have electricity. And news back then was a one-way conversation so we would just get information about where the bombing was happening, where there are checkpoints, but we really did not, we, and then when, we, and the, when the news bulletin ends, we just discuss it, or the elderly people would discuss it among them. And back then, we didn't have uh, the tools that you ha have today, which, uh, which is the social media. So when I think back uh, during the 80s and 90s in Lebanon, how war, was reported and how we report it today, I find that there is a very big difference. Um, we went from radio and newspaper and news used to travel very slowly. So by the time we got the information in the newspaper, it was the next morning. So you all know how that was, how the drill was. But, um, uh, but this left something in me about, you know, being interested to become a journalist. I think this is how, how it started. And uh, by, when I was 10 years old, I, uh, the Christian, I used to live in the Christian area, and the Christian and militias decided to kill each other. So there was, uh, so they cut the road, and I, a child of 10, 11, was left stranded in one place, and my family was somewhere else. And I had to go with the, Leb with the Lebanese Red Cross uh, across a minefield at the age of 11 to cross over so I can go and rejoin my family in two weeks. But the reason why I'm telling you this is because this is when I understood what propaganda meant. When we were in that side, we used to hear that the militias on the opposite side were raping the women, they were uh, you know, forcing men to fight, they were assassinating people, and when I crossed over through the minefield, whether it's, you know, figuratively or actually I did do that, I found out a different reality. The militias were not abusing the people, they were actually bringing food, water, and providing shelter. So this also marked how I always thought about news as we have to cross through a minefield in order to get the other side of the story. And this is unfortunately what is not happening today. So when, when we say changing patterns in journalism from information to entertainment, today in our world today, journalism is not just about information. It's about how we entertain an audience. When I first joined Al Jazeera English in uh, 2006, I walked into a newsroom for the first time with a group of foreign journalists. And having come from the Middle East and witnessed all these um, wars and conflicts, the, I, I was a, a humanitarian in the terms of wanting to give a voice to the voiceless. I wanted you know, to give a voice to the people who have not been heard. And I remember in my first editorial meeting, the editor-in-chief, we were talking about, I think, uh, maybe the bombing of Gaza. I, I'm not, I don't remember, but I remember it was, we were talking about war, and he looks at me and says, yes, but how are you adding color to your piece? And I was like, excuse me? He said, yes, how do we make this two and a half minutes package interesting for an audience? And I said, but isn't you know, killing civilians, I mean, pictures of civ dead civilians, enough? And I was told clearly that in today's 24-hour news, the facts are not enough. We need to entertain. We need to keep people interested in the story because people's interest will die out if it is not entertaining. This is why when you go on CNN, BBC, um, BBC to a lesser extent, but uh, Fox News, you, you see, you, you, now it's visual effects. So you see, the, you see this thing and then the 
colors, and then it's HD, and you know, it's the sound and the music and all the, all the effects, the side effects that go with the story, but it's not really about the story. It's not the information. So these things with my childhood and you know, crossing over and the propaganda and all of these things and the color that we had to add to our stories um, made me take the decision as a young journalist to actually cross over and try to understand what is it about that you know, people discuss the refugee crisis or Islamic organizations? What is terrorism? What, what do these terms mean? And are these people really as bad as they're being portrayed? Who, who are they? Like I, I really had, I, I had the, the curiosity to find out who, who they were. So, um, so the, the, big, the biggest challenge to me uh, was access. How do I get to these people? How do I reach them? Um, is it safe? Is it not safe? How do we build relations and connections? Um, and the pictures that you will see here in this presentation are all taken, they're my individual pictures. These, not, these are pictures that, of experiences that I've been through. So as you can see, the first one that we see here is these are the um, life vests of the refugees who have reached uh, the shores of Mytilene in Greece, the Greek island. And, um, and we're going to talk more about this in details and how, and how this happened. The second issue was the issue of refugees. Um, Lebanon, back in 1975, witnessed what people call a civil war. And one of the biggest uh, elements that played a big role in that war were, were the Palestinian refugees that had fled from Israel in 1948 and 1967 to Lebanon. This had scarred the nation so bad that any talk about refugees would actually make people freak out. Uh, also, uh, the, the Syrian regime uh, occupied Lebanon from 1990 till 2005 uh, and they left after the assassination of our late Prime Minister Rafi Hariri. So you can imagine how putting the refugees and Syrians together, how the Lebanese feel about it. Especially those who um, supported the regime in Syria. So mainly, as you all know, we have uh, a paramilitary force in Lebanon, Hezbollah. And Hezbollah has been actively engaged in fighting alongside the regime against the opposition. So this was an extremely divisive issue in Lebanon, whether we host the refugees or not, how long they're going to stay, what is their sect, who they are. All these questions were, were very uh, contentious issues in, uh, in politics and uh, mainly in media. And the role of the media in Lebanon did not help with, um, with the refugee issues because, as I said, they kept bringing the Palestinian issue up. So, um, so this was also a very, very div divisive issue. For those of you, uh, are, are, is everybody familiar with how Lebanon is divided? Uh, along the sectarian lines, or uh, should I? Should I uh... Many should not be. OK. We are a very, 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 very small country. We're 10,452 square kilometers. And we have 18 recognized religious sects in Lebanon. So we are a, a con what we call a consociational democracy, where different religious groups, whether they're Christians or Muslims, are represented in, parliam in parliamentary seats. And on uh, 7th, uh, 6th of May are our parliamentary elections. So out of 128 seats, they're divided between 64 Christians and 64 Muslims. Within each division, there are different. So you have the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Protestants, and then you have the Sunnis, the Shia, and, and the Druze. What happened is that most, the predominant number of refugees 
in Lebanon coming from Palestine and from Syria are Muslim Sunni. The fact that they're Muslim Sunni creates automatically a fear in the non-Sunni uh, uh, elements of the Lebanese uh, social fabric where they're def dot automatically scared that you know, they will side with the Sunnis in case there is naturalization and they will create an imbalance. No one from the Lebanese Sunnis has ever, politicians have ever discussed naturalization. Nobody used the, the issue to scare the others, but just the fact that they are there has been used by the media and the politicians. So as you can see in Lebanon, the refugee issue is an extremely controversial matter. In a country of four million, does anybody know how many refugees we host, Syrian refugees, in Lebanon? Do you have an idea? I'm Lebanese, so 1.5 officially. Uh, yes, and we have around 2,000 births a day over seven years. So it's around 2 million people. So in a country of 4 million, we have 2 million Syrian refugees in Lebanon. So this is definitely a very uh, divisive and controversial issue. And I will uh, get into more details and discuss how when somebody, uh, when a journalist actually crosses over, as I said, and uh, decides to cover the story differently, how the media and uh, the people deal with it. And it's really, really bad. You become uh, a pariah of the state, an outlaw. People perceive you as if you are the enemy. And I will, I will show you a few examples of what happened and we'll discuss it. And the third most, con most contentious issue, as, uh, as we all know, are the Islamic organizations. Mainly when we talk about uh, Islamic organizations fighting in Syria, uh, and they've crossed over also to Lebanon, uh, mainly Al-Qaeda affiliate, Nusra, Jabhat al-Nusra, and later on the more extreme, which are ISIS. So these are the three topics that we will, uh, will get into. Um, and please stop me if you have any, uh, any questions of the stuff that I said. So I'll start with the migrants and refugees. This picture, I don't know if you can see uh, clearly. This uh, was published three days ago. It's, uh, it's how we Lebanese deal with migrant workers. So this is a prominent uh, beach resort. The ladies sitting on the bench pay 40,000 Lebanese liras, which is around $30, to not, uh, so that they can sit on the, on the matla. But for them, bringing their maid to the, to the beach and actually making her sleep and the hot sand and not paying for her is the perfect example of how we treat migrants in Lebanon. Sometimes you walk into a restaurant, you see the family having lunch. The maid is sitting or standing by, sometimes she eats, sometimes she doesn't eat. It's not important. So uh, we, have, we don't have uh, a problem of, as I learned yesterday, migrants without papers, correct? Because yesterday I said illegal my, uh, immigrants and uh, I was corrected by Professor Giro saying we call them people without papers and this I like very much. Uh, we don't have a problem of people coming uh, from, uh, from like, Im well, we're a very poor country so nobody wants to come <laughs> and stay in Lebanon, because they're not going to make any money, really. But we get a lot of domestic workers. So, uh, and unfortunately, domestic workers are not well treated. Uh, but because we have, unlike neighboring countries, a very vibrant civil society, so there are a lot of NGOs who are working on uh, migrant workers' rights. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, stories. Some of them are kept without food, they're locked up, they're being beaten. We have a lot of, of such problems, but I think this picture sums up uh, the, whole, uh, the whole situation. Uh, what, was, what was good recently also about 
media covering these stories uh, is that uh, we've had a hype recently in two types of TV shows. So we have more satire uh, on TV, prime time, and we have talk shows, social talk shows. And the good thing about the media is that they bring these things up in those shows. So they bring people to actually create awareness and defend the rights of the migrant workers uh, in Lebanon. So um, this is the part of the migrant workers. Um, this, is, uh, this is what we were discussing earlier, um, the long refugee walk that I took from, uh, from Izmir to, uh, to Germany. And uh, the story was that I was following a pregnant woman, uh, well, a young girl, she was 19. Uh, and uh, she, was, uh, she fled Deir ez -Zor. And Deir ez -Zor was back then controlled by ISIS. And what I uh, learned from her and from her husband is that if a husband uh, leaves for three months, then automatically the wife is to be wed to another ISIS, to, a, to an ISIS member. Because when, when uh, she was seven months pregnant, and when I asked them why did they leave, so the, the husband was escorting her, and he said, because if I leave alone, and the husband is the guy in the, in the gilet, the yellow. Waste, coast. Waste. Yes, the, the one behind me. So this is the husband. And, uh, and he said, because I don't want to go back and see my wife married to another man. So uh, they had fled the resort. She was seven months pregnant. And she had to uh, walk through, uh, through like seven countries. So we took the boat from Izmir. Uh, and it was a very, very devastating uh, experience for everybody. Because uh, the smugglers, they control all, all our movement. So we are meant to uh, hide at night. And then we move in groups. And uh, by the time we reached the olive orchard, which was right by the, and I think I have a picture of us sleeping there. These are the vouchers that they, this is the lady, the lady in green with the headscarf. She was, uh, she was the one we were following with the story. Um, so this is where we slept, uh, waiting for the rubber inflated boats to move us across. The journey was meant to be one hour and a half. And uh, on the buses, we were told that there will be around 20 people on the rubber uh, boat. And when we, when we got there, we were surprised that there were 45 people, which means that it's overweight. And I remember clearly, you have no say. You cannot, even if you change your mind the last minute, it's not allowed. Uh, they will actually use the guns to force you to get on those boats. So by the time we got on the boat and more people were coming, there was uh, an imbalance. So the water started coming in and people took their shoes off and started getting the water outside the boat. There were children, women, elderly on the boat. Most of them didn't know how to swim. So during that trip, I remember we, I, I was seeing the water coming and I know how to swim, and I had the life jacket, but the only thing that you think about at this moment is, how many people can I save? I can swim, but what about the others? What about the children? And uh, it was really very, very, it was the, I, th I think it was one of the most uh, scary, scary uh, situations that I had been through. And then we, uh, we had to fix the balance, so the water stopped coming in. And again, with the shoes, they got the water out, and they were, everybody was screaming. The other thing that uh, we, what we went through was um, on the boat, uh, the, the smugglers, they don't get on the boat, so one of the people of the refugees would actually drive it. So it seems that the guy who was driving it had no experience, because um, while we were crossing over, we were, there was a big cargo ship coming across. And as you know, it will create waves. So the guy, instead of going from behind, he was actually going from the front side, which means you know everybody would be dead because the big cargo ship doesn't cannot stop and they would not see us. Then somebody took over last minute and had to 
uh, like go sideways on the on the waves, so so nobody falls off. And this is where we found out that the petrol that they put in the engines is only enough to get you to the border. But because we had to do like a detour, so we had to take a longer road. So the petrol was not enough. So we were 200 meters from shore, and then the boat stopped. And there's no way that you know people could swim there. It was really far. And then I remember there was the Hellenic uh, rescue team, a group of uh, Greek um, volunteers who used to uh, man this border. They towed us and they got us safely to shore. So the, so the gilet that we saw here, so these are, at, uh, this is also interesting. From far, when I looked at this, I saw it orange. I thought, oh, this is a beach where people go hang out. I thought these were like, you know, parasols and, and it was like incredible. The closer we got, I was like, no, these are, <laughs> these, are not, these are not people. And gradually, I saw this pile of life jackets. So you can imagine the number of people who were arriving. And while we were there, seven or eight boats got to shore. Now let me put this a bit in perspective so we understand the business behind the smuggling. Every person who got on the boat paid $1,200 per person. Every day, the smugglers move between 500 and 1,000 people from, to, from Turkey to, I'm sorry, my husband is, is, he does the math, so how much is, is that? <laughs> exactly, it's like 1 million, 1.5 million. That's a lot of money. There is a smuggling industry and a smuggling business that was being run at the expense of people who were trying to flee conflict, persecution, and poverty. And this made me very, very sad when I, I saw this. And I discussed this extensively on television. It was also mentioned during the documentary. And I, I also sat with... Uh, with people in power. And I also believe that Turkey also um, facilitated this. And I was, uh, as I was explaining earlier, also another incident happened while we were walking at night. So in one of these bushes, but in, in the Turkish side. And, uh, and I didn't realize that there was somebody who suddenly put the torchlight on the floor. And I looked and I saw the silhouette of an individual just standing there in the bushes. And, this, and then I realized that when I started looking that there were these men on both sides manning this operation from behind the shadows. To me, I think they were somehow intelligence. They knew this was going on and I think they did nothing about it. Maybe they were even making money out of it, I don't know. So basically, uh, as you can see, the lady was carrying a child. These people walked seven countries. So um, uh, another also thing that I would like to mention about this was the fact that when you reach the Greek shores, taxis are not allowed to pick people up. People walked on Mytilene Island to reach the UN registration point we were told, I mean, I was told around 80 kilometers, which was like the, they would arrive the next day. They had to walk. They were not allowed to get on in taxis unless they register and they're given a white document, a UN document, where then they can get, they're allowed to get into taxis. And they are driven, there is a refugee only uh, cruise ship that gets all the refugees on, and it's also another 14 hours overnight to get, uh, to get to Greece. There are these, the, the, where you see these people walking, those are refugee-only roads, refugee-only buses, refugee-only trains, refugee-only boats that were moving people. The refugees and the rest of, your, of the population, they don't mix. 
So the governments were facilitating, not facilitating, but they were, they were moving people from one place uh, to the other collectively through these uh, processes. So what happens is you get to Greece, then you go from Greece along the Macedonian border where I got arrested for eight hours. And the reason I got arrested was, if you see, I was carrying a bag, a cross bag. And for some reason, the, the guy calls me up and says, you, come. I was like, why me? <laughs> he says, you come. I came. He said, what's in your bag? Uh, when you get to Mytilene Island, to the refugee uh, registration point, you can change your identity. It's very easy. You just give them any name, you, they take your fingerprints, and you move on. So you could be any person back in Libya, in Syria. So I can be Carol Malouf in Lebanon. When I got to Greece, I became Aya Shade, somebody else. I, it was part of the experience. I wanted to give them a fake name to see if it goes through, and it did. So the guy tells me, give me your document. I gave him the white paper, and my name was Aya. Then he said, what's in the bag? So I got out my Lebanese passport, which says Carol Malouf. So he, look, <laughs> he looked at them and was like, uh, so you're Lebanese, not Syrian? I said, yes. He said, what else in the bag? I also have an Australian passport. He opens the Australian passport, looks at me and says, I don't understand. <laughs> I said, I'm a journalist. So he looked at me and said, you journalist, crazy. I said, I'm documenting this. It didn't go well. He said, you're not allowed to be with these people, and we're going to take you. And they took me. Uh, I was uh, put in a cell and questioned for eight very long, eight long hours. And then I was deported to Serbia. Meanwhile, I lost the group that I was with. Then we, re we regrouped in Belgrade. And from there, we went through Hungary on trains, special trains, and from Hungary to, uh, I think, Croatia, then Austria. And from Austria, I lost the pregnant lady. And I lost the story. And I didn't know where she was. So, uh, and uh, I didn't know if you know, she was still pregnant. I mean, if she had any problems on the way. Then, luckily, I found her in Germany. So I flew to Germany. And, uh, and we ended the story. And two weeks later, the lady, not two weeks, two months later, sorry, the, the lady gave birth. But the sad thing about it is the uh, cultural shock that the lady and her husband went through. Uh, six months later, in Germany, they got divorced. And this is uh, very common with a lot of the immigrants or the refugees who are coming from a different cultural background. Uh, it's being proven that it's very difficult for them uh, to cope. From they, they were peasants growing the land, living in a community with their families. They went to a more individualistic society where they had to deal with things differently, more open. You know, they come from conservative environments. These are liberal, democratic environments. So uh, the, the social issues that the, ref the refugees are going through, I, I understand that the host communities are, you know, they have their concerns and suffering, but it's also important to consider when these people, you know, leave home, leave a certain lifestyle that they've been living for 20 or 30 years and going to a different reality. So this is why sometimes we see uh, domestic violence, men killing their wives, posting it on social media, divorce, very high crime rate. You have a question? Uh, I don't know if you heard, but like recently this man killed his, Syrian man killed his wife and posted it on social media. Did, and did, was it covered here? Okay, it was huge within the Syrian communities uh, back in uh, Lebanon and Syria. So, uh, so these, th these things, they have their emotional toll on people. In Germany. Yes. Um, I remember, if, unfortunately, th this documentary is not translated to English. But I remember uh, I interviewed her. She was crying. 
And I asked her, why you're crying? And she said, on the boat that took us, the cruise ship that took us from the island to Athens, she was sleeping and her husband was upstairs. Uh, and when she woke up, she found out that he was flirting with an Iranian woman. But that's not the point, because what she was saying is that, and it was very significant, she said, the Iranians are killing us, and they're bombing us, and my husband is flirting with them. And it was one of the most striking sentences or, or metaphors that I heard a 19-year-old saying. And she was really crying her eyes out. And it's in the documentary. And I think I remember I cried as well. So this is, um, does it, it has a pointer. The red one. I try. Oh, yes. So, so this is her, and this is her husband. And these are all their neighbors. He, he, he's, um, he dyed his hair. He's not blonde. <laughs> but uh, he's, uh, he's 13. Um, okay, this is another story. If I have a minute, I can uh, tell you more about it. Okay, how much time do we still have? You have been speaking for half an hour. Okay, good. Um, his brother, so these are brothers. This guy is 21. He's 13. And I asked him, aren't you scared? Like, why, why did you get your brother? And he said, it's easier to get immigration if he's underage. I said, really? So you, you're really putting your brother in danger so that you can get all? He said, yes, it's easier, easier for my family to come. So if, I, so if he's underage, he gets papers quickly, so they don't have to wait for a long time. So these are some of the, you know, the stories that, uh, that you hear along the way. So um, this is me, very tired and sleeping on the... But the reason why I put this is because... Um, um, this is the refugee camp in, uh, in Greece. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, th this was just, I didn't, I didn't want to put the pictures of other people, but, um, but this, th this is how it's, the situation is like. You just walk and you find people sleeping on the, on the sides of the road in the whole island. So imagine the number of people that were just stranded there for, uh, for a long period of time. So... Um, so this is basically what I wanted to discuss with the refugees related to, uh, to their trip to Europe. And um, as for Lebanon, I will, uh, I will be a bit, uh, I will not get too much into the details and the politics of it, but um, as I said, two million refugees, most of them live in camps. And um, a lot of them, uh, do not have uh, proper access to, well, uh, uh, so other Lebanese, because we don't have electricity in Lebanon. Uh, so we have gener more like individual generators. Yes, it's the 21st century, I know, but unfortunately. So they don't have access to clean water, to san sanitation, to, uh, to uh, even, even the camps are not protected. So there's a lot of uh, um, rape, and uh, a lot of uh, discrimination against women that happens in those camps. And unfortunately, uh, they are not covered by the media. And if we cover them, then you know, we become the target of, uh, of, uh, of those organizations. Uh, so um, the UN is doing their best. Local NGOs are doing also their best, even the government. But still, it's a very huge problem that we need to deal with. So um, I, I will move from the refugee uh, issue to the to Islamic organizations. And this also has something to do with, uh, with my story with refugees. <coughs> I want you all to look at this picture before I say anything. And I want you to think, what do you see? And I want you to share your opinion with me before I tell you what it is. Any ideas? Yes. It's not the idea that we think that we would uh, say, but I think 
they are not actors. So you just carry the flag. They flag, but the people around you are not. Uh, they're not they're ISIS. Not like Who thinks they're ISIS? Are they ISIS? The flag is, is But the ISIS. flag is ISIS. Yeah. So why he's not ISIS? Because he looks cool and he's wearing sunglasses. No, why, why he's not ISIS? I think you wouldn't be smiling. <laughs> you will see me with so, in another picture with Nusra smiling. So no, the smile is, is always there. <laughs> I would smile for pictures. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, yeah, probably that could be one thing. Another thought, anybody? I mean, they say a picture speaks a thousand words, right? So what is this picture telling us? What, what do you see? And I'll explain to you why I showed you this picture and how, um, what's the perception behind it. No, nobody? Okay. It's true, these are uh, Kurdish fighters, the Peshmerga. And, uh, and they had here taken over Mosul and we were the first journalists. This is my colleague, Ruth Sherlock, from the Daily Telegraph. And we were the first journalists to actually get access to get to the Mosul Dam a few minutes after uh, they kicked ISIS out back in 2014. The most controversial issue about, about this picture is that it made everybody unhappy. Why? The extremists got at, uh, at us because, you know, we are in short sleeve, not covered, holding the flag. This is, you know, blasphemy. Chop their heads off. The other people who use this against us, you see, they are with ISIS. They support ISIS. So you can't, I mean, nobody is happy. The extremists are not happy. The, 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 nobody's happy. The most dangerous thing that we do in today's world is when we assume that pictures speak a thousand words and we don't put them in a context. And the role of journalists is exactly that. What we should do is explain images. And what's happening today is that we see images out there, but we don't really understand what they are, so we interpret them each from his or her, her own perception. So this is why I said a picture does not say a thousand words. Unless we clearly put it in a context, unless we write a clear caption, unless we explain what it is, every person is going to uh, understand it in his or her own way. So th this is the problem that we are today facing with citizen journalism, for example. Where, where people in conflict zones actually take pictures, they post them on social media, news agencies uh, pick up these pictures or TV stations and they post them as they are without putting them in context. Whether it's a chemical attack in Douma or uh, phosphorus attacks or uh, uh, I mean anything that has to do with conflict it has to be explained. And this is where I want to get into the issue of social media. Social media does today play a double-edged sword. On the positive side, you remember the radio and the one-way conversation that we used to get? Today, social media has allowed us to have a two-way conversation. So I can, I can put something out there and I get feedback. I can, I can hear, I can read and I can understand people's position and opinion. And this matters and it's extremely important to know what people think. It also, it's a good way to gather public opinion about a certain issue. So sometimes, you know, I don't know if it happens here, but in Lebanon, uh, one, uh, uh, a prominent TV station called the Lebanese Broadcasting Corporation, every day, they launch a hashtag of a social or a political matter, and they get people's opinion on social media, and in their news bulletin, they portray, it's just for social media or public opinion, and it's important to hear the pros and cons and people's opinions about it, so I think it's, good, uh, it's a good way. And it's also a quick access to information, so right here, right now, I can know what is happening in the world, unlike the things that used to happen before. But there's also a lot of misinformation, 
So there's a lot of uh, misleading information that is out there. And I have suffered a lot from this, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. So while I think social media is good, in a sense, now we have access to politicians, for example. So our prime minister posts uh, selfies, uh, he writes uh, you know, tweets, we get, we get access to him, you know, we, we can reply. So before, we didn't have access to politicians. State-run media used to keep politicians very far removed from the people. Now, with the current uh, trend of social media, we can interact with decision makers directly. So this is also a good way of, of communicating. Now, this is where I will get into my second part of how social media refugees and Islamic organizations will go together in this part. This is me. And this says, here, yeah, in Arabic, Jabhat al-Nusra. So this is me in Nusra headquarters. Maybe some don't know what our Nusra was. Ah, you, you don't know? Maybe. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jabhat al-Nusra is Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria. But how did I get to Al-Qaeda and why? And we'll discuss the controversy behind this picture in a minute and how we're going to pull all this together. I worked on the refugee crisis in Lebanon. First, I went as a, as a journalist to cover the border town of Arsal, where an influx of refugees had come, but also they came with the militants. And very few people were, like people were scared to go there and the UN agencies had red flagged it. And when they red flag it, it means, you know, they don't go there and all the NGOs affiliated to them don't go there. But there were 30,000 people in that area stranded between the Lebanese and uh, Syrian border of Arsal and nobody was going there to cover their stories. So I said, okay, I'll go. I went. And this is where I went from just being a journalist to an activist, and I started an initiative called Lebanese for Refugees. And we started collecting money to help the people where the UN agencies and NGOs wouldn't go. But who were really these 30,000 people? Most of them were the families of the fighters. But we didn't know that. So news starting to resonate because, okay, so let me just try to explain this geographically. So the fighters were at the top of the mountain and the families were more an, an, in the valley part. So we had access to the valley part, which was the furthest point after the Lebanese army checkpoint where nobody really went there. Maybe if we have a minute, I can show you a two minute video of what I'm talking about. So when we got there and then we started building tents and getting aid, the families were telling the fighters that there is this Lebanese Christian girl who is helping us. And her name is Carol Malouf. So I became this famous activist among the, the fighters without, ha I, I had no idea that this was happening. And they also knew that I was a journalist. Fast forward, this was 2012, 2014 a group of fighters storms in, in the town of Arsal and kidnaps 14, 14 Lebanese army soldiers and they take them with them to the, to the outskirts. And this became known as the kidnapped Lebanese army soldier crisis. And they stayed there for almost two years. And they were divided between Nusra, Al-Qaeda affiliates, and ISIS, because Nusra and ISIS were in that area. Nusra executed two of them, two of the Lebanese army soldiers, for reasons I'm not gonna get into. And for a certain period of time, the ones with ISIS we knew nothing about, so they went dark. When, the, when Nusra uh, allowed 
the family after a year of the kidnapping, Nusra allowed the families to visit the kidnapped soldiers. Their condition was that if they come, Carol Malouf had to escort them. And I had no idea. I was doing a distribution in Tripoli. I received a call. Tomorrow, 6 AM, you have to escort the families to go and see their sons after one year. And this is how their sons looked like. This is a Lebanese army soldier. But here, they looked exactly like Nusra. When the families walked in, and they saw their sons sitting all dressed in black, the only way they recognized them was from their name. They didn't look like themselves. They looked very different. Now, I'm going to say something that sounds like I'm defending the fighters. But never in my life had I seen any organization that was so organized as these people, ever. And the problem is when I say these things, people accuse me of being sympathetic. It's not true. This is a fact. They had the families come out of the buses, and they gave them numbers. At first, we didn't understand what the numbers were for. Then they made them stand in line, and they called the number, and the number was for the, for their, for the son, so for the kidnapped soldier. So it's not like everybody went in and it, it was so organized that it, ma it made me wonder, like, our, I mean, when they went to see their families, when they came back from, uh, from being kidnapped, you should see it was like a farm uh, in, the, in the presidential palace. The families were all over each other. Everybody was hugging, and it was crazy, like pushing journalists. And I, and I kept thinking, that, no, how come these people are so well organized? They had given each kidnapped soldier a chocolate to give to, her, uh, to their children when they walk in as a gift from their parents. And they, and they sat with them. And here you can see it in the background. So basically, those are the families. And those are the kidnapped soldiers. And they were in a cave. So this, this where we are here, is a cave. And it was all dressed in, uh, uh, in co yeah, it was all covered. So uh, I remember we were there for like two hours. And then uh, the emir came their leader, and he gave a speech about why they were there and, uh, and how they, I mean, the reasons why they kidnapped them. And, and the, the argument was that they were trying to protect the civilians. So it's soldiers versus civilians, because the Lebanese army was uh, mistreating a lot of civilians, uh, civilian refugees in the camps. Now, I was on a mission with the government to through the refugee crisis, through the Islamic organizations, to help the families to see their children. So on the surface, or not on the surface, but it is actually a good cause. What happened on social media? Uh, the pro Hezbollah people didn't like it. They didn't want to humanize in any way the Islamic militants. So they want, so the best way to do it is to show that I am a bad person. So a lot of cyberbullying, character assassination, even direct threats, intimidation, and a lot of lies. And this is one of the posts, I know it's in Arabic, but here they even got the name wrong, and it says that I am. Uh, responsible for moving the booby-trapped cars across the border to Beirut. This is a serious accusa accusation. Because we had cars uh, blown up in Hezbollah stronghold in Beirut, in the suburbs. I was... Uh, <laughs> I was, people, I mean, this post was on, um, on social media with my picture, but with another name, but yet accusing me of being behind these, uh, these car bombs. So this is just an example of uh, what 
me and others. This is only, I mean, other people go through this as well. But I'm just sharing with you my, uh, my personal experience. Um, this is another incident. I'm also in, uh, in a headscarf. And th then you can ask me why, if you want, later on, why I cover my head. Um, those two are the, uh, the captured Hezbollah soldiers, or not soldiers, the Hezbollah fighters in Syria. They were captured uh, by Jabhat al-Nusra, same group, Al-Qaeda affiliate, in Aleppo. And nobody knew anything about them for three months until I was there to also do a human story for the fifth anniversary of the, um, of the Syrian revolution. And I was um, threatened by a small uh, group affiliated to ISIS uh, called uh, Ansar al-Sham. They were called Ansar al-Sham. I didn't know they were there. So they saw that I was there. They accused me of being um, uh, a foreign spy. And they were coming to get me. I had to contact uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. I was put under their protection. And while I was there, I was offered to interview those uh, soldiers. Um, and uh, I, when I came back from Syria, I, it took me six weeks, actually, to tell anybody that I had this interview. And as we were discussing yesterday, when, as a journalist, you have to think about your audience. And the audience is always divided into the people who will sympathize, understand, be informed, but also the people whom your work might hurt. And I knew that if this goes out, this will hurt Hezbollah, because they were talking about the money they were getting, the indoct indoctrination that they go through, uh, what they tell them why they are going to fight in Syria, and a lot of lies that were uncovered in this interview. So I knew that once this goes out, Hezbollah will not like it. And, um, and my life before and after is going to drastically change. So the TV station, I had offered it to MTV, a local TV station, to do it in one of their primetime shows, was also threatened by Hezbollah. And the interview was cut down from 54 minutes to seven minutes only. We did the episode. Uh, it went on the air, it went viral, everybody was talking about it. And uh, the next day, uh, articles appeared about me, uh, that Carol Malouf went to jail, uh, that, uh, you know, here, this is a picture of me in articles uh, saying every possible bad thing you can think about. This is uh, Al-Akhbar newspaper, it's uh, affiliated to Hezbollah. So, and this is where I got the call to leave the country. I uh, went to Turkey. So the interview was on a Wednesday. Uh, I, there was an intermediary from Hezbollah negotiating with me over the rest of the material because they didn't know what was in it. Okay, I said, okay, if you calm down, you stop the smear campaign, the character assassination, I will not uh, publish it. But they didn't stop. The articles kept coming out. I gave them an ultimatum, Monday, 3 PM. I don't know, maybe I was crazy <laughs> back then. <laughs> and I said, OK, you have the 3 PM, and then I will publish it. And I actually did. And the next morning, not this morning, an hour later, 100,000 views on social media, because I published it for free on YouTube. And uh, and the articles came out, the woman who defied Hezbollah. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I didn't defy anybody. I, just, I was just doing my job. This is material that needs to go out. And I was threatened. My family was threatened. I used to get uh, text messages. If you're not worried about yourself, worry about your family. So it was really uh, dangerous. But uh, with time, it cooled down. We reached a settlement and I went back to Beirut. So this is just part of what happens to people who, uh, who do things uh, where other people don't like it. Um, and this is where another spear campaign happened. So this is one of the posts that was done about me, and it says, um, and I'll translate. It says, news came out from sources in the Syrian opposition 
that there is a love affair between Carol Malouf and Abu Mohammed Jolani. And the Jolani is Al Qaeda leader in Syria. Zaim militia Hezbollah, which is the Zaim militia Jabhat al Nusra. And they had met several times during uh, Carol's visit to the areas that are under his control. Meaning, I have a love affair with him, which is seriously ridiculous, and uh, that he paid me $1.2 million to start uh, uh, a campaign where, you know, I will make them look better. These are just examples of when we cover wars and decide to cross the minefield to the opposite side. Uh, and we come back with a different story, a lot of people will not like it. Because uh, there is this uh, mass, uh, like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a mass, uh, I don't want to call it mass delusion, but there is this, this, this huge, uh, I don't know what it is called, I mean, if you can help me, it's this, this thing on social media that, that you put something out there and it's just, it, it goes viral without people actually digging deeper, try to understand, try to see a different point of view. So if, if these are labeled terrorists, they're terrorists. But why? Why are they terrorists? Why nobody really, you know, tries to ask the questions, who are these people? Why do they do these things? What drives them to do it? And and who supports it? Who's behind it? Are they acting alone? Are they, is it state-sponsored? Is it not state-sponsored? There's so many questions that we really take for granted when we just read the news. Terror attack in I don't know where. What does terror attack mean? Has, it has not even, I mean, terrorism has not even been properly defined in any UN charter until today. But it's just terms that we repeat over and over again until they become, re become reality and, and fact, and we don't really know who started it and where it started and, and, and who was behind this whole thing. But we just pick up terms and, and we move about with them. So uh, basically, this is, uh, this is what I wanted to say. This is the lady that we interviewed I was telling you about. Uh, now she lives in Germany. and. Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, the lessons are, I just want to wrap up with, with, three, with three points. The, the first thing is, um, if you are interested in journalism, it's hard if you want to swim against the current. But uh, as long as you know that you are telling the truth, I think this is important. And, uh, and it needs to be encouraged more. Uh, the second point is, when you go to meet a certain group of people, make sure you do your homework well, because just as I didn't know that there was ISIS in Idlib, this could have really gotten my head chopped off. So sometimes, you know, we do our homework, but we don't really do it well. So we have to do more homework when we go to these war zones. And the third, uh, thing I want to say is that really over the past uh, 10 years working in the field in places like Yemen and uh, Libya and Tunisia and the revolutions and Egypt, and I was really lucky to be part of all these uh, groups and uh, you know, p to witness what, what happened. Um, it's uh, most of the, peop of the time the people have real grievances, but, uh, but it's just like the powerful get to control them. And then, as we saw in the Arab world, what started as an Arab Spring ended up with, uh, with ISIS. And, uh, and I think it was um, it's really sad what happened to our part of the world. But uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. So let's open the floor to questions, comments, opinions.